It's the Friday morning pit. That means it's time for the mailbag. Got a lot of great questions. A lot of them are about NIL and the transfer portal, which to be honest, that's all anybody wants to talk about these days. It's understandably what everybody wants to talk about these days. And we've got a lot to talk about those topics these days, particularly today, Friday on the morning pit. So let's get your questions about NIL, the transfer portal, and a lot more on the mail- morning pit mailbag here on youtube.com slash panthalair.com. Yep, Friday, end of the week, right here at youtube.com slash panthalair.com, and that always means it's mailbag time. We cover a lot of topics, whatever topics you want to talk about when you post questions on the message board at panther-lair.com. You know that website, panther-lair.com, pittsburgh.rivals.com. It is the most comprehensive source of pit sports news on the internet, football, basketball, and recruiting. You find it all at pantherlair.com, and message boards interact with hundreds and thousands of other pit fans. All day, every day, panther-lair.com, pittsburgh.rivals.com. Stay there to get all of your pit sports news, and then you go to the message boards at pantherlair.com to talk about all of the pit sports news with other pit fans who are just as interested in it, just as obsessed uh, with it, and just as... uh, fanatical as you are so go check it out panther-lair.com pittsburgh.rivals.com is the website and then of course our youtube channel right here youtube.com slash pantherlair.com is the place we put all of our pit video content had a lot of it in the last couple of days of course the morning pit videos each day of the week monday through friday we had our weekly live stream that we did last night instead of wednesday night usually we do it on wednesdays but we did it last night just because of uh, the pit basketball game on wednesday night so we had that right here at youtube.com slash pantherlair.com we had a lot of post game coverage from the game uh, on Wednesday night, Jeff Capel, Bob Carrington, Ishmael Leggett, plus Steve Forbes and Efton Reed from the Wake Forest side. And then, oh, on Wednesday, there were like four football transfers who talked to the media. Eli Holstein and uh, Jake Overman and Key Thompson and Nile Upa, the uh, long snapper who transferred in from UConn. We have all that stuff right here at YouTube.com slash PantherLairCom. So you want to make sure you don't miss any of our video content. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, YouTube.com slash PantherLairCom. Uh, and then you can turn on notifications so you'll get an alert every time we go live for one of our live streams, whether it's a weekly live stream or a post-game show, or when we post new video content right here at youtube.com slash pantherlair.com. So like this video and subscribe, that way you won't miss anything that we do. Let's jump into some of these questions. Like I say, NIL tends to dominate the conversation these days, NIL and the transfer portal, and certainly that was the first question we got this week, SVPig1 says, with the NIL landscape dominating college athletics, do you think the mid-Power 4 teams are going to focus NIL efforts on one sport mainly? Example, it's hard to win a national championship in football, but basketball could happen as there are only 12 players and NIL efforts could pay off with a better return on investment. Another question, if you want to try it, how do you see the portal impacting graduation rates and will the NCAA care? So on the first question, will teams focus on, or will schools or collectives, NIL entities focus on one sport over the other to some extent it's driven by the fan interest you know i i I think they're probably at at a lot of schools and a lot of collectives there are probably groups of fans who just donate a a lump sum to the collective and say use it wherever you want to use it but i also think there's probably a fairly significant amount a fairly significant number of supporters out there at schools across the country who say I'm donating this money to the uh, collective to support football or to support basketball or to support this or to support that, to earmark that money. I mean, a lot of, you know, uh, much in the way that you do with, um, you know, bigger donations to the university uh, or the athletic department. You say, I want this to go toward the weight room or this or that. Now, I mean, obviously, if you look at Alliance 412, you have donation options. You just donate a lump sum or a monthly amount, and that goes into sort of the general fund. But I think if you're getting into a bigger size contribution um, or, or a larger amount for your membership, there's I, I would imagine that a lot of those gifts and donations come with certain earmarks. And so to some extent, I think you're driven by the fans and what the fans want. Uh, as to, you know, sort of specifically where you're talking about football versus basketball, I, I think you're right. You need um, you need fewer guys to get it done in basketball, right? You, you get one or two key guys and you can really put yourself over the top. The, the conflict there 
is that those guys in basketball realize that you only need one or two of them to put you over the top. And so the, the price goes up. You know what I mean? The asking price goes up. And so what you might hear about for a, a top end basketball transfer might be more than a you know mid to top end football transfer just because the impact is that much greater. I mean, you really can get yourself into you know a really strong position for the NCAA tournament and, and potentially making a long run there with the one or two key additions. You get a, a great point guard and a great center, um, you could get pretty far in March Madness, you know? But those guys know that. And when we talk about market value and what the market's willing to pay, I mean, I think collectives are willing to go pretty high for those top end transfers because of the impact that one guy can make. Now, those top, top end transfers in college football are going to get a lot too. There's no question about it. You know, if Marvin Harrison had decided he wasn't going to go into the draft, you know, it should be Marvin Harrison Jr., just to make sure we know who we're talking about. If he had decided he wasn't going to go into the draft, um, but he also was not going to return to Ohio State, if he was going to go into the transfer portal, he was going to get a lot. There's no question about it. But I think, you know, you end up with similar amounts invested, football and basketball, just more money going to a couple individuals as opposed to sort of the same amount of money going to, uh, you know, a bigger group of players. This doesn't necessarily answer your question, though. Should teams like this focus on one or the other? And I mean, I really think it depends on what kind of resources you can raise. Uh, if you want to make a priority out of one sport or the other, I, I understand that. Uh, and, and certainly, you know, if you say, all right, we raised a million dollars. Okay, well, that million, we could split it 500 for football and 500 for basketball, but we're going to have a little more of an impact on the basketball side, and we're probably going to miss on some opportunities on the football side. Well, if you say, okay, we're going to shade that two hundred, you know, seven hundred fifty thousand to football and two fifty to basketball, you, you know, you, you're sort of you you have to decide how you're going to split that up and and how best to use that money. It's not an exaggeration to say that these collectives operate with a certain the approach of almost a, a general manager, a, a, you know, or somebody trying to operate with a not really a salary cap because it's not a salary cap, but you are limited by the resources that you have, and you have to decide how to use those resources best. What do you need the most? What can you get the most? And you also, I think, live in the moment of uh, like right now. Over the last two months, the focus has been on football because that's the tr those are the transfers that are available. Uh, you know, you get to the end of the spring, you get past the basketball season, you want to make a you know you need to start building up uh, the resources for basketball for retention and addition. Then you start you know doing more sort of capital drives. Um, if I was a school, if I was a collective for yeah, you know, let's not, let's not say pit, but let's say like. What are the schools that I always mention in, in that great middle tier of the power four conferences? If I was, if I was Georgia tech and I was the Georgia tech collective, um, you know, to some extent, I, I, I would say this, as I sort of think through this in, in my head here, to some extent, you, you need to know your fan base. And, and what I mean by that is, would the success of football or the success of basketball drive more support? You know, if you could invest more of the resources into football because you know that football will motivate your people more, then that's worth doing. You know, you often say like, oh, football and basketball pay for everything else. And that's that's true to a certain extent, you know, when you talk about athletic department budgets and revenue and that kind of thing. Um, and I think with collectives, you, you, you could take a similar approach. If you have... You know, who knows, Georgia Tech, you know, that was, uh, this is what made me think of it is, you know, Georgia Tech, they might have a more motivated basketball fan base, in which case you dedicate a little bit more resources to basketball right now to try to build that up, to get a great season out, uh, out of the basketball team next year, and then, you know, use that excitement and enthusiasm to drive more support for the collective, which you can then continue, you know, using for basketball, but also try to build up football. I think it depends on the school and, and the fan base and, you know, that kind of thing and, and how you want to divert those resources uh, it, strategically because I think there's a strat a lot of strategy involved. As far as the other question, how does the portal impact graduation rates? 
And will the NCAA care to the part, second part? They may or may not care. It doesn't matter. Um, how will it impact graduation rates? I mean, I think, you know, ultimately it's going to hurt them. Uh, I, I, you would like to think it'll all sort of come out in the wash, but ultimately when you have players leave for the transfer portal, that's going to go down as a guy who doesn't graduate from your school. Um, and, and so, you know, that, that's going to hurt the APR and all of those different things. You know, I remember when, when Pitt would have a, a guy leave early for the NBA, when Steven Adams or Ken Birch left early, you know, Adams for the NBA and Birch, uh, what did Birch do? Did he transfer or something? Uh, yeah, I think he transferred. Um, you know, that hurts the graduation rates, even though they go to a different school, it, it, you know, or, or go to the NBA, it's hurting the, the graduation rate. So I, I, you, you'd like to think that you have, if you have 10 go out, you'll have 10 come in and then it'll bounce out. But I don't think it really works that way. I think graduation rates will be hurt. And that doesn't even touch on the matter of, you know, whether guys are less likely to graduate after transferring. I'd be interested to see data on that though, for sure. Uh, 121 rum asks, do you think people's concerns about losing Jalen Lowe and Bub Carrington if he does, doesn't go pro to the portal this offseason are legitimate. It feels overhyped as a concern to me at this point. Um, it doesn't feel overhyped to me. I, I do think the concerns are legitimate, not because Jalen Lowe or Bub Carrington or anyone close to them or anyone with real knowledge of the situation has turned to me and said, hey, Lowe and Carrington might go to the portal after this season, but simply because there's a reality. And the reality is Anybody who's good, anybody who's good will have opportunities if they go into the transfer portal. NIL opportunities. Everybody who's good. And this isn't a hyperbole or an exaggeration. You know, you know, sometimes we say things in, in sports media that's well, everybody runs on this team, or you know, this this team can't stop anything, or this they score every possession, or something like that. It, it, it's hyperbole. We we delve into hyperbole, particularly in this sort of format, this sports talk kind of format. But this is not hyperbole. Okay, this is not that. This is not exaggeration. Anybody who's good has an opportunity to go. Okay, anybody who's good will have an nil opportunity out there. Anybody who's good will have a team willing to pay them to go. I think I think I, I don't want to say all of Pitt's basketball roster has some sort of NIL deal. They probably do, but I would say the returning guys, the guys who contributed last year, the guys who played last year, all got something to come back to pit varying amounts, but they all got something to come back to pit and they all had opportunities to get something else to go somewhere else. And some of the guys we're talking about, some of the guys from last year's team who got something to come back to pit are not on the level of Jalen Lowe and Bub Carrington. They're not, they're simply not. And these two guys, if they decide, you know, assuming they both decide to do at least one more year of school, will be hot commodities on the transfer market should they decide to enter. Let's let's not kid ourselves even before they make that decision. They will be hot commodities with offers on the transfer market. And if they stay at Pitt, it will be a result of a... It's the best word. Attractive NIL package? Competitive NIL package? Substantial NIL package? I mean, you're talking about two second-year guards? You know, you're two guys who are who are excelling as true freshmen playing in the ACC, that is prime, prime target area to get a really good NIL deal to go somewhere else. Should you be worried about Bub, Lowe, Bub Carrington and Jalen Lowe leaving? Yes, insofar as you should be worried about everybody leaving. And and I think that applies to everybody. But with these two guys who are exceptional freshman guards, it applies even more so because of how ideal they would be as targets in the transfer portal. I don't think it's overhyped. I, I really don't. The stories I've heard over the last three months, just on the football side, if you are good, if you show even the potential to be good, you will have opportunities to go, which means Pitt and Pitt's collective are going to have to step up and find ways to keep guys here. They kept Blake Hinson in here last year, and they kept a few other guys here from last year. It's going to take, I think, a more substantial effort to keep Lowe and Carrington here. 
you know, and I mean, if Bob Carrington wants to go to the NBA, then, you know, you know, via con Dios, you know, I mean, I, I don't think you'd really try. I don't think you try to compete with that number. You don't try to compete with the pro number, but you do need to compete with other schools. And maybe there's not that big of a difference between the numbers. If you're talking about, you know, exceptional freshman guards like these two guys. So is it a legitimate concern? Yeah. Should, is it overhyped? No. I think it's something very much to watch it for that we'll be keeping an eye on uh, as they enter the off season. Had a question from last week that it didn't really get a chance to, uh, d- didn't have time to get to, but I wanted to uh, bring it up here. Uh, Chad the Jet says, uh, with incoming players, this is a football question, with incoming players to help the defense, Pitt can have a good D up front. No real big timer there, but better, uh, pres- I guess, than they were last year. Still, the secondary is an unknown, and I'm not sure the quality of the talent is up to what it has been. Who do you see getting playing time back there, and how good can the secondary be? Well, you know, the secondary, of course, is four positions, right? And, and I think, I, I don't think it's, I don't think it tells the whole story to paint with a broad brush of who's going to make plays in the secondary, who's going to be good in the secondary. I think you need to look at it a little bit more specifically at the four positions, because if we talk about the safety spots, I think you feel good about those those positions going into next season. I really do. I think Javon McIntyre and Donovan McMillan got a ton of really valuable playing time this past year and played pretty well for the most part. P.J. O'Brien right there in a three-man rotation with those guys. I think safety looks good. I, I really do. The question is going to be at corner where you lost Mark Wes Williams and uh, uh, A.J. Woods and M.J. Devonshire. And they brought in one transfer, Tamon Lynham, from Nebraska, but it's really going to be, you know, assuming they don't bring anybody else in after the spring, it's going to be relying on homegrown players it's going to be relying on guys who are on the roster now like Tamarian Crumpley Rashad Battle Rylan Gandy Noah Bigelow and then even down through the ranks Shadarian Harrison and 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 so on and so forth you know the true freshmen they brought in this year you're going to get your corners out of that group um I think there are talented players in there you know Gandy and Bigelow and Crumpley have been you know Battle has been hurt but those other three have sort of been waiting their turn patiently behind you know, guys who have stuck around for a long time. Williams and Woods and Devonshire have been here for a long time, and they had to wait behind Pinnock and, and Mathis, although Williams was playing in that group. But Crumpley, Gandy, Battle, they, or not Battle so much uh, because he's been hurt, but Bigelow, uh, Gandy, and Crumpley, those guys have been waiting behind Devonshire, Woods, and Williams. Uh, they're going to get their opportunity this year. They're going to get an opportunity to win a starting job or a spot in the rotation this year. I think we could see them go with a four-man rotation. I think they probably should. That would make the most sense, uh, given that they're breaking in a lot of new players, keep them healthy, keep them fresh, moving in and out, and try and see if the cream will rise to the top. Uh, but that is one of the big question marks. Uh, I I don't know. Like I think the defensive line should be better overall, but I'm – Really curious to see who emerges as a, a playmaker there. Who emerges as a, who emerges as a, a guy who can be productive off the edge. I'm really intrigued by Nate Matlack. I really think it's time for Dayon Hayes to have that big season. I mean, big season, uh, because if he doesn't now, it's never going to happen. This is the time for Dayon Hayes to really break out, and so I'm you know I'm looking for that. I think Nate Matlack will be good. Uh, we'll be interested to see what David Ojebwe can do. Certainly, the pedigree is there. Seems like Nikai Johnson might move inside, but they brought back Nate Temple. They got Bam Brima back. Um, you know, Nikai Johnson at, at defensive tackle could be a really interesting guy to have there. Sean Fitzsimmons is there. Elliot Donald is there. Isaiah Neal is there. Nick James came in as a transfer. So they've got bodies. I just don't know. I just don't know. I don't know who's going to make plays there and, and really make that big impact that they need, which can obviously take a lot of the pressure off the corners. I mean, the job for the corners gets much easier if the D-line is is getting a lot of pressure and, and getting into the backfield. Now, conversely, the job for the D-line gets a lot easier if the quarterback doesn't have everywhere to throw the ball because the corners are playing really tight coverage. So there, there's certainly a lot of synergy there. It's symbi- symbiotic, but... One of the sides, one of the ends, either the the defensive line or the corners, needs to play well and and, and make plays and uh, and be effective. So that 
kind of remains to be seen because I think you're counting on a lot of guys who haven't done it before. Certainly a corner, you're counting on a lot of guys who haven't done it before. And it, you know, on the defensive line, you're counting on guys who maybe have played but haven't really produced at that breakout level that Pitt needs this year that they weren't able to get last year. So a lot of question marks there for sure. But I think when we talk about the secondary in particular, I don't, I, I don't think we include the safeties there because I think the safeties are pretty good. And I think they will be pretty good again this year. I think they'll be even better this year than they were last year simply because we've seen that happen. You know what I mean? We've seen it happen with Brandon Hill and Eric Hallett. We saw it happen with DeMar Hamlin. You know, we've seen guys get better at safety. They get that first year where it's, it's a trial by fire, and then they settle in and they they really play at a high level. And I think McIntyre and and, and uh, McMillan uh, and P.J. O'Brien are going to have that year this year. So I, I like the safeties. Corners are a big question mark. All right, great questions this week. I, 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 I think – we could talk a long time about NIL and the transfer portal. And I think we will continue talking for a long time about NIL and the transfer portal. Uh, but we had some, uh, uh, you know, I enjoyed the conversation about it today. If you have thoughts or comments or reactions, put them in the chat screen, uh, wherever it is over that side, I guess, or on the message boards at pantherlair.com. I'd love to have a interaction with you there. So make sure you check out the website, panther-lair.com, pittsburgh.rivals.com. And then of course, our YouTube channel here, youtube.com slash pantherlair.com. Like, and subscribe. You won't miss any of our pit video content. Thanks so much for watching the uh, morning pit videos this week and everything else we've done. I hope you've had a great week. Enjoy your Friday, and we will talk to you, uh, well, and enjoy the weekend. We'll talk to you on Monday with the morning pit right here, youtube.com slash